Hey, what's up, man? Um, good video. I mean, you, you definitely, uh, you know, based on this short interview with Hammeroff, uh, seem to have destroyed a few of his, his claims. But, you know, um, in an actual conversation with him, maybe it would be a little different. He would be able to respond to your points and recontextualize them. Um, I can't say that I, I am that familiar with Hammeroff's quantum consciousness ideas. I've watched one of his videos, actually three or four days ago, and that was the first time I'd really heard of him, even though I did see What the Bleep Do We Know years ago, and he was in that movie, but I didn't really put two and two together until a few days ago. Um, I haven't read Penrose's book either, but I have read Dennett's critique or, or criticism of Penrose's ideas in Darwin's Dangerous Idea. He almost devoted an entire chapter to uh, refuting Penrose. Um, but unlike, unlike you, I don't think the functionalist or emergent uh, emergentism ideas can account for consciousness. And the reason is that when we look at other systems that we need the notion of emergence to account for, like ant colonies or tornadoes, um, we see that, yeah, when simple components uh, reach a certain um, level of complexity, you know, when there's enough ants in a colony, all of a sudden this new organizational pattern emerges that wasn't present in any individual ant. You know, an individual ant is as stupid as stupid gets, but you put enough of them together and all of a sudden there's this very uh, intricate and complex you know, a society that emerges, and they have differential uh, differences of, um, you know, labor, and it's, it's astounding that this occurs, but we can understand it in terms of emergence. Now, what an ant colony doesn't do when it emerges to this complex state is produce a state of consciousness or experiential phenomenological interiority. Um, the ant hill doesn't have a unified self that experiences itself as an individual. Um, and so I don't think emergence can account for consciousness. It can account for the complexity of behavior, the ability to learn, and so forth. Uh, and if experiential states of consciousness didn't exist, you know, if we didn't have the ability to reflect on ourselves, if we didn't feel pain, sense color, you know, uh, understand beauty and meaning and purpose and all these things we associate with our first person consciousness, then emergence and functionalism would explain it all. Because we could, as Dennett does want to do, understand not only all of evolution, biological evolution, but all of uh, consciousness, what neurons do, as an algorithmic process. And this is where Gödel's theorem becomes interesting, because if consciousness is just an algorithmic process, um, then, you know, as you said, Gödel's theorem doesn't really get us out of this uh, idea that consciousness is not free, um, and, in, and in fact is just either, either, either it supervenes on the physical brain states, the neural correlates, or uh, it's just plain reducible to them. Um, but Gödel's theorem does not apply to any system. Gödel's theorem applies to formal system, that is systems wherein the symbols um, that are used to define the system have no meaning in themselves. The meaning that they, that they have is derived from their relationships to other symbols. Um, and so, as I said, if we didn't have this experiential awareness of being a body, or consciousness, we could describe the brain in, term, in terms of a formal algorithmic system. But because there is meaning in our conscious states, because there is more than just uh, the computation of um, you know formal structures, I don't think that we can account for consciousness in terms of algorithms. Mathematicians, human mathematicians, can understand. Uh, that a certain axiomatic formal system uh, is true, even though the system itself cannot prove itself without becoming inconsistent. Um, and so Penrose, I think, has a point there. Now, 
this is why I adopt a form of pan-experientialism, because we do have these experiential states. They can't be reduced to the properties of just a formal system of basically shapes interacting with one another, like gears, um, because we aren't automaton. We aren't zombies. We experience ourselves. You know, we feel pain. We see color. Um, we feel love for other people, and, and so on. So there is experience, and I don't think emergence can account for it, because you know, while you say it, it's not like this on-off switch where all of a sudden that thing becomes conscious because it's reached a certain level of complexity, um, but even if it's not an on-off switch, how do we gradually move from dead, insentient matter that interacts just based on the laws of physics and forces, how do we transition from that to conscious awareness? How do we transition from nothing but exterior surfaces banging into each other to interior experience? Um, you know, I'm open to an explanation for how this occurs. I haven't heard one that convinces me. And so I think that Hameroff is onto something when he says that consciousness is in the world itself. Um, that in fact all material entities, at least, you know, it's not that a rock is conscious, but say atoms, molecules, cells, multicellular organisms, any any entity, material entity that can be defined as a self-organizing unity, I think, has a degree of experience. Not human consciousness with all our psychological, um, you know, baggage and, and all of our uh, abilities to think rationally and logically and speak a language, not that kind of consciousness, just very basic experiential states such that they're not just mechanically interacting. Atoms, say, aren't mechanically interacting with other atoms, but in fact uh, meaningfully interacting with other atoms. Um, so that's where I stand on this. Uh, I'm interested to see, you know, how you, how you, uh, respond to what I've said, so let me know what you think, and uh, thanks for your, your videos. Uh, I'm going to go watch some more of them. Take it easy.